Now streaming live. Good. Um, so welcome to the third lecture series in our speaker series of 2021. Um, I'd also like to tell everyone I have uh, put on uh, live captioning. So I think if you go into your um, your controls, you're going to be able to turn on live captioning if you need it. Uh, before we get started, I first would like to do the land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, our presence on the traditional territories of many indigenous indigenous nations. And I'd also like to recognize their longstanding relationship with these territories on which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. Um, the area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat, as well as the Metis. It's now home to many diverse First Nations, and we acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region, for which we are very grateful. In addition to this, we in the Department of Computational Arts in AMPD would also like to acknowledge the virtual networks on which our activities and gatherings are cited, it is a product of Silicon Valley and Zoom's headquarters, and that are also located on the Muwekwa Aholone territory. So I'd like us to get started uh, now that I've uh, done the territory acknowledgement. So um, as you know, know that we've decided to host bi-weekly lectures by exciting artists from around the world to take advantage of the new norm, the Zoom lecture, and the ability to invite people no matter where they are in the world. Um, so today, case in point. Um, so uh, just so you know what to look forward to in the future, on March 19th, we've invited Dr. Lindsay Grace, who is a Miami um, creator. He's a game designer, creator, and creator of the Black Game Maker Initiative. He is a night chair in interactive media and associate professor at the University of Miami School of Communication. But for now, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to the fashion tech designer, Anouk Wiprecht. Um, so Anouk designs and creates intelligent systems that interact with the body and the environment of the wearer. Uh, Wiprecht combines sensors, animatronics, interaction design, and human behavior in her creations. Her designs move, they breathe, they create smoke, and they react to the world around them. So Anouk has been tremendously successful at partnering with tech giants such as Autodesk, Google, and Intel. She's worked with car companies like Audi, as well as brands like Swarkovsky. Anouk is both a friend and an ex-collaborator. She and I met in 2010 at a residency in Vienna. Uh, just after she, after we met, she actually went on to dress Fergie of the Black Eyed Peas for their Super Bowl mm -hmm. halftime performance in 2011. So that was a, a moment that a nook exploded onto the scene. <laughs> so the title of her talk today is Robotic Dresses and Biomimicry. And so without further ado, may I present to you a nook Wiprecht. Hello, thanks for Perfect. being here. Um, before we get started, can I ask that everyone please turn off their video so that Anouk can um, take the stage? Thank you. Great. Uh, thank you so much for the uh, the introduction. Uh, you're awesome. Um, yeah, Jane has already uh, uh, mentioned a lot of things um, about me. If you want to uh, yeah, connect with me later on, uh, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all that stuff uh, under my name. So um, yeah, what I try to do is um, Basically, I got trained as an um, as a fashion designer, fashion and couture, like couture tailoring, and um, I started that when I was 14 years old. When I was uh, 17 years old, I got into robotics because for me to step into fashion was about um, fashion being expressive. But I started to realize that once I started my fashion design study, that all the things that I was making were actually analog. They were not doing something. If I would feel happy in the morning, I would put a happy dress on, like a flower dress or a bright color but that would not change with my mood during the day sort of you know so in like yeah when i was around like 17 years old i started to get interested in robotics because for me the robots were like the, the brains and the heartbeats I'm not sure. that i wanted um my uh, my garments to have almost so what i do is i uh, research uh, the spaces that are around us the intimate the personal the social and public space and I will tell you something about that uh, later on. And I also work with body sensors to sense the body as well. 
Uh, this notion of uh, yeah, personal space comes from uh, the proximix uh, theory of Edward T. Hall. And I think if I remember myself correctly, that's in a, a book or a topic that, uh, that uh, James spoke about uh, when we met as well. Uh, so you, she might also have showed you the same book and all of that stuff. Uh, basically in the 60s, Edward T. Hall was measuring uh, people's personal uh, spaces, personal distances. And he was doing that with uh, like a stick, an, a wooden stick, and he was measuring that sort of and that uh, research was interesting for me, uh, but I took that research and used um, yeah, distance sensors like ultrasonic rangefinders, for example. Um, he wrote a lot in, uh, in this book. That's the book that I referenced, uh, The Hidden Dimension. So uh, taking that sort of that research of uh, these different uh, yeah, personal spaces that we have around us, these, these different spaces, and also thinking of different cultures, um, I was like, yeah, starting to uh, interpret like a sort of using the use of this, these sensors into the dress. So one of the dresses that uh, is based on proximity sensors, sorry, is the, uh, is the spider dress that you can see here. So this dress measures up to 25 feet. And when somebody steps into the personal space, it attacks. There's uh, mechanics on the uh, shoulders, which are servo based. So um, the dress is not reacting just in one way. Like if it would just attack in one way, it would be really boring sort of. Um, I programmed something that I call a 12 states of behavior, depending on how you interact with the dress and where you you're standing in a space and the speed that you walk towards this dress, it's reacting differently. So uh, you can see here a little bit of um, what my hands body. Sometimes I like to um, hide the, um, the cables, the wires, uh, the electronics, the batteries, and sometimes I really like to show it. In the case of the spider dress, I really want to uh, like show where everything goes because I want to make it also uh, like easy to understand. Um, this was created when I was working at Intel, and uh, we introduced the Intel Edison, the board that it's based on, to the makers and the maker scene and uh, the maker fairs. So I wanted to make, for example, children or, or enthusiasts easily understandable that, okay, these are the wires for the sensors, these wires are for the servos and this is where the battery goes and all of that stuff. And I think it also uh, really, um, yeah, advances the uh, sort of the aesthetic of the design. So here you can see the back piece with, with the whole system in there and everything plugging in. Um, you can see the uh, respiration sensors in the sides and also the proximity sensors in the front. For the make a fair, what I mentioned, we also made uh, spiders that were dancing. The, People could like uh, like work with and program them, uh, children as well, and they would be uh, like dancing on stage. Um, and at CES, they were also walking behind uh, the dress. So that was really an, uh, a fun uh, project. Another project was with uh, Italian architect Nicolo Casas. Uh, this was the first project that I used um, fully 3D printing uh, for. So I did that with uh, Nicolo Casas in, uh, in the software uh, Maya. So one of the things was that uh, we could not print the full dress in the printer, so we made them in parts. The dress, the smoke dress is based on the notion of an octopus uh, who is pushing um, out ink and then dives away almost where the spider dress is about a very defensive, very alpha kind of V-shape uh, notion. Um, I think the smoke dress is much more uh, sort of elegant. It has this pear shaped design and it's also uh, in interaction, it's much more elegant because it pushes up uh, smoke. It's based on sensors as well. And the more people that are standing surrounding this dress, the more uh, smoke it uh, puts up in the air almost. So for one of the things in that dress uh, was important uh, to not just push out the smoke, uh, which I did in a former design, to have the smoke go into the hip area, make it turn around, and then it's being pushed out through the geometry of the, uh, of the dress. At that time, and this was 2012, um, um, there was a new technique in SLS, selective laser sintering process called uh, working with TPU, so thermoplastic polyurethane, uh, which was this like uh, rubbery material so the dress could uh, conform and become uh, very flexible. So there was a kind of cool uh, new technique that I could work with with uh, the company Materialize in Belgium, where we uh, printed this dress. And um, this is how it uh, looked. It was created for Volkswagen for the yeah, uh, it was a big showcase in Germany. And there were eight designs that were in the end connected to the different colors. And yeah, the smoke dress was one of the dresses, was eye catcher. 
uh, takes me back to how I know Jane because, uh, yeah, what she mentioned in 2010, we both did an artist in residency in Vienna. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit uh, about this later, actually, because I have some more slides to, uh, to show. But uh, in the end, what we ended up with making was the Dare Droid. It's a uh, robotic um, yeah, cocktail dress. You needed to play a game of truth or dare with uh, the dress. And then, depending on <laughs> your performance, you got a drink or you didn't got the drink, or you, you, did, you got the alcohol or you got sort of uh, no alcohol in there. And so uh, we, we created that for um, Ale Thibault from Electra. And it was a really uh, yeah, fun process. So here you can see it at the Techno Central exhibition uh, in Vienna that I was curating uh, that we uh, yeah, uh, also showed it. So basically she has an interface on the arm and um, yeah, uh, she takes you through like uh, the questions of truth in there. Um, it's the questions were from uh, yeah roll over the floor to bark like a dog and um, it was surprising to us that everybody um, actually did uh, what the dress wanted um, these people to do sort of so basically um, yeah my question is if and when you put technology on the body what does it do uh, how can it become uh, social or playful like the their droids uh, defensive and behavioral, like the spider dress, um, sensitive and expressive, like the smoke dress, uh, like what does it do other than just blinking and bleeping? And um, that comes from, yeah, the notion of working with like inter uh, interaction design and also what uh, the, yeah, electronics and technology can do. And the main thing is like really seeing fashion as an interface other than an analog thing, like, yeah, the top that I'm wearing now, how can it uh, morph with us? How can it know something about ourselves? How can it express us in different ways? Um, yeah, how can it be playful and all of that stuff? So that is really my big rooted uh, interest. So some of the process, and I'm taking you back to uh, really <laughs> like uh, older projects. Uh, one is uh, Dare Droids, that's, um, sorry, Pseudomorphs that I did for V2. It's the Institute of Unstable Media in the Netherlands and I did a residency there in, um, I think it was 2008. But just to show you how a thought process goes sort of, you know, what I wanted to do was I wanted to capture the dance that a drop of ink makes in water so which you can see here and it's for me that magical moment that you almost cannot catch because it's um, based on the fluidity uh, of these uh, two mediums uh, merging almost you know and uh, the weight of it so the next step is okay how does that uh, look like so i'm sketching or i make a 3d model or a 2d um, yeah sort of uh, collage almost um, because I want to see like what do I want to uh, work towards sort of you know because um, it's it's yeah for me always a golden uh, like an, a red uh, line through your work um, because if you don't start with a sketch I notice that I just uh, yeah go too far from what I actually am uh, interested in and it's not super practical so sketching and all that really helps uh, to getting some paper from that first uh, fascination or interest point uh, from there on it's like how uh, do I <laughs> yeah work this out sort of at that time I uh, ran to the nearest hospital and uh, I asked them <laughs> for a lot of like stuff and tubes or whatever they had left and they were happy to sponsor an uh, artistic project and still until now I don't know exactly what it is but it's a lot of like pain pumps it's a lot of tubes and all of that stuff so that was really a uh, fun sort of uh, yeah just uh, called uh, calling in hospital and, and see what they have what they don't use sort of and they were happy to help and uh, they knew uh, V2 from there on, uh, yeah, looking at uh, how and what for in the next stage, um, I found at Festo uh, solenoid valves that are normally used for air. Um, I use them for uh, liquids, which is normally not uh, the case, sort of, but it works out for me well. So you can basically click them open when you, when you control them. The, um, uh, the ink was pressurized together. So whenever they open, it would uh, shoot out basically. So these are the pumps. Um, the first uh, control board that I was making was with Simon de Bakker at uh, V2, which is this one. It was running on a nine volt battery and it was all in your custom uh, setting, uh, which uh, took a few like derivatives. And then the end result was being presented at uh, ICEA in Germany. And it was this um, yeah, live presentation of um, the sort of the ink dripping on the dresses it was a little bit a mess <laughs> but uh, in the end all the um, every dress that was uh, yeah dripped sort of and absorbed uh, was um, hanging around the model so it was kind of a cool it was in between like a live performance and a little fabrication uh, hole sort of uh, brings me to another uh, thing that um, that I did with um, yeah Jane and also with uh, with Marias 
uh, the product that I just showed. I also want to show you some of the process behind that. Uh, so I dived in my, into my hard drive in order to get all these um, these uh, images. I met uh, yeah Jane um, at my residency, and at that time there was also by our friends of Monochrome they were doing an um, Robo Exotica. It's uh, a festival for cocktail making uh, robots and uh, based on the notion of like um, pseudomorphs Jane said like hey why don't we reuse sort of the, the, the things that you did with pseudomorphs and we create uh, this new dress and then we started to basically brainstorm how that uh, cocktail dress could look like so again, the first steps is always like sketching, seeing what we want to do, where it will happen on the body, what's the interaction, um, how can it look like, and then going a little bit deeper in like, yeah, mostly you just make a lot of sketches during like brainstorming. Then you start to like, yeah, work out some uh, some things. Um, in this case, like we were working on like, what what's the case going to be? Um, Jane did a really good uh, job at like using like some of the, the silicon and the casting, and then uh, we had the opportunity to present it, uh, which was, uh, of course, a lot of fun here on our model, uh, Carmen. So that was basically the, um, yeah, sort of the prototype of the dare droid. Um, later on then we could work on it again, but uh, this is basically the front view and, uh, and the back view as well. Um, yeah, the aesthetic of the cables, I think was, uh, was uh, really cool to really like run with that sort of, you know, uh, what I mentioned before. So then a little bit uh, later we got invited by Ale of Electro Festival, which is a really cool festival for electronic arts in Montreal and a really well-known uh, festival as well. Um, and uh, yeah, we started to take this notion of the uh, the dress again and started to work with uh, my model, Lara. Uh, she also came to, uh, to um, uh, Montreal. The first time that um, uh, Jane actually introduced me to uh, 3D printing uh, because she had the opportunity to, um, I forgot where she was at that time, but to 3D print uh, the front piece. So if we could model it, then she could uh, 3D print it there. And um, that was actually like really cool because uh, yeah, we could have a much better like geometry than uh, sort of the, the heart shape box that we had uh, before. So it became this really like very alien design almost, you know, with uh, the back piece and all the wires and all the cables and everything that we learned basically from the first prototype sort of so this is um in the end so became the dress we had a really cool hairstylist uh, and sean uh, in uh, in montreal that is this is crazy uh, crazy hair and um yeah that became that uh, that became that dress so one of the things in research and design is uh, what i already mentioned you have a lot of versions or in, in in my case i have a lot of versions because the cool thing about electronics is you always learn something new so i might make a dress at one point and then two years later you might want to have done it totally different or have um, new technology or electronics at hand and um, that's always what i think is funny about fashion like fashion is always in and out and it that, therefore it creates a lot of waste because uh, it has an unrealistic expectation of what the product is sort of it has a lot of value when it's trending and when it's out it, it doesn't have it doesn't hold any value anymore uh, that's not what i notice when i'm building things um, it's still in the notion of fashion but i update and i upgrade these designs almost you know so that's kind of an interesting thing uh, my smoke dress from 2005 or from 2007 or from 2009 um, is not the same as the one of 2012 because i learned new things and um, yeah they get sort of upgraded and updated um, in a way and also the, the spider dress i just want to show you uh, it was also a baby before and the spider dress was um, actually built uh, I think it was four years or five years before, and it was based on a game 
called Limbo. I um, I did a project and I was really tired. And my friend Daniel said like, okay, Anouk, go sit on the couch. And uh, he gave me the this game in the hand sort of. He said like, oh, you might like this. And uh, the, the game is Limbo. I don't know if you can know, you guys know it, but if not, you should uh, download it. It's really cool. It's this really eerie game of this, uh, this boy walking through this, um, yeah, black and white, eerie kind of landscape. But what I thought was really interesting in this game is an um, encounter with a an, uh, spider. And the spider was really sort of abstract, but I really liked the relationship between the boy and this sort of spider legs that you can see there. And as the boy was moving towards these uh, legs, uh, the spider tried to catch it. And when the boy moved away, uh, yeah, sort of, it was this like interplay. And of course you need to at one point be smart and, and go about this spider but the only thing that i've been doing was like walking forth and back to this uh, this spider because I, I thought it was really interesting kind of relationship uh so with my friends the first time that um what i mostly do is like writing out an abstract why i think it's interesting discussion points uh, and then possible like, interactions and like research topics and all of that stuff and um together with my sketch that's just a really interesting and really important document for me because again it's about the red line like what are you doing and it's good to have it on paper either in a sketch visuals uh, or also maybe like written out sort of you know so this was that uh, document. The next step is like uh, seeing how that can conform around, um, yeah, sort of the body because the inspiration is there, but can you make it um, like small enough for the servo motor, for example, you know? And also would this just work from an elegant uh, point of view? If the system becomes too big, it's not elegant anymore, sort of, you know? So basically, we laser cut it out some parts and we were like just like pulling wires in order to see if this could be uh yeah in a nice way conformed uh on the shoulders um around um around the the body based on an uh, like model of an um a spider bot so that works out so <laughs> it was for another um yeah festival called fifa le robots in uh, Prague, because somehow there was a little movie going around and this festival thought that uh, <laughs> that the dress was already existing and we were like oh no it was just like an, a prototype so actually we had an opportunity for this festival to create the real deal which was kind of an, um, an headache to, um, to do in a short amount of time. But that became the next version of spider dress which was really a laser cut that's over uh, 200 screens. Uh, it was mainly created at, uh, at home. Uh, uh, yeah, working with this dress, it was interesting but it's from like definitely like um, the because again it was important to uh yeah to create something that uh that's um in yeah, it has a lot of possibilities sort of in robotics that you speak about degree of freedom. So the more degree of freedom and um, an system or a robot or whatever can have, uh, the more you can do with it sort of, you know, so that was kind of cool to work with these mechanic uh, spider legs because they had a lot of uh, possibility to have this uh, amount of degree of freedom in all directions sort of to make uh, very interesting animations with. So that was basically the, the baby of um, how that started, um, a laser cut uh, version and then at the Intel, uh, we could work on making that like sort of the 3D printed uh, design that it is now with all the knowledge and also based on the on the Intel Edison, uh, which could also um, help uh, couple some uh, body signals to it. So in the, the black version with the black spider dress, uh, one of the things was that um, it basically always always went off. And um, I, I didn't found that really pure to the system sort of. So in the white version, uh, the model has like a respiration sensor. So when she's meeting people and she wants the system to shut down basically she breathes in and she breathes out and by that the system goes into like a sleepy mode so she can control the dress but not by a button but she can control it and go in sleepy mode through her breathing which uh, was kind of an, uh, uh, yeah, a fun way to uh, utilize that 
So one of the things that um, I think is always important when you're talking about these projects is that, um, yeah, as soon as you think about wearables, especially uh, you, you might walk with them in, in certain locations. Those might be uh, private terrain, like your living room and wherever, you know, but you might also go a lot in uh, public spaces, sort of, you know. Um, often if I do projects, for example, with Cirque du Soleil, um, I might, uh, on the ticket, it might say like there's project insights, it uses cameras or facial recognition and so that people are aware of that. Um, but you can also think of maybe, uh, yeah, look at things that are invasive now, maybe a camera. So what can be non-invasive? Uh, in my case, I was working with uh, proximity sensors and heat sensors in order to get the same effect sort of. So uh, this project is based on that. It uh, happened exactly a year ago and it was COVID, time of COVID. So this was my own personal COVID project. It's the uh, proximity dress. So it's again based on the proximity sensor. And when somebody comes in my neighborhood uh, in a six feet ratio, uh, the dress makes me feel bigger. So there's these like, um, yeah, sort of uh, mechanics in the hip parts that go out because uh, especially here in Florida and in, in the United States, people were not really sensitive about personal spaces. So I thought, hey, I'm going to create a solution for that. So it's kind of funny, not necessarily like, oh, wow, now I stay away. But it's more like, oh, what's happening? You know, and you can say like, well, my system is indicating that you're coming too close right now. Uh, that was for me just an, uh, an, an interesting research point. And it does does catch a lot of um, yeah it does catch a lot of questions sort of so again it's um, it goes into this uh, notion of the spaces so the intimate the personal the social and also the uh, public space again and um, in this case like using a um, camera would have made me um, get my data it would have said okay where are the people. Uh, and what's the distance sort of, you know, but I did not want to use a camera in this design. So what I did instead was I overlaid um, uh, data from the sensor and from a heat sensor as well. So basically what I had is that I wanted to figure out uh, how many people were in my space and where they were sort of. So my ultrasonic range finders, uh, they can say, um, uh, basically that something is coming in a space but they don't know exactly what is basically a blob so a blob is moving in a space or moves out so the distance to person i can measure the speed of the person i can measure i cannot necessarily measure how many people so in this project i just want to measure uh, like who was around me basically so uh using a thermal sensor in that case um it cannot say um how far or where sort of it can say how many bodies there are in front of you uh, so it cannot measure the distance to the person the speed of the person or um, it can measure how many people so it's kind of interesting to overlay then uh, those two sensors together in order to get what you uh, could have gotten while using for example a camera uh, but in a way this um, talks about like using something that is um, invasive versus like non-invasive in where uh, sometimes it takes a little bit more time to create something that might be a little bit more gentle uh, to measure your environment in this case uh, with. So I think that's a kind of an interesting uh, yeah, way if I speak with uh, companies, sometimes if they would use like facial recognition and a camera, you're, I would think like, okay, what is exactly the yeah the, the thing that you want to measure what data do you need and then think basically about like creative solutions that you can almost like uh yeah work around that using um less invasive uh ways so the last uh, topic that i will uh, speak about is uh, body signals so you can uh, measure the yeah I, what i do is measuring the surroundings which i already uh, talked about um, i'm also measuring the body uh, in uh, different ways in different projects but what you can think of is for example eds so you can measure uh, brain signals um, you can measure the, um, uh, the blood volume, uh, BVP, EMG, so muscle contraction, uh, EDA, galvanic skin response, pH, um, respiration, so the lung volume, uh, the place in space of your body parts, um, heart rates, and also your heart volume, uh, your temperature, oxygen, and um, many of the, the blue sensors, sort of the surrounding sensors as well. And this is of course not everything, but there's a lot of interesting ways that you can just uh, measure the body. So one of my projects is based on EEG, so brain signals, and it was for Ars Electronica. Um, they invited me to do a residency and instead of asking me to create a dress, they wanted me to work on a device. Um, so I chose to work on a project uh, with uh, children that have ADHD. So I created this uh, project called Aging Unicorn, so it had like a little camera in the unicorn horn 
and it measures the children's <clears throat> brain signals and it measured the focus. So whenever the focus was high, the camera would go on and record whatever was happening around them. And for me, it was like to bring a little bit of awareness um, that uh, to make basically the children understand that everything and um, yeah, all the things around them basically have an effect on them. And um, especially when you have ADHD, that, that has a more effect on you than uh, maybe another person sort of. And um, so now there's like yellow scratches to my screen. I don't know what it is. Um, so that became uh, Aging Unicorn. So it is a uh, little camera uh, in the horn. And uh, you can see here uh, one of the kids, she was like, I was testing with her. Uh, wear it. So the first part of the of the like sort of the research was like if a camera is overhead, what can it see the most? <clears throat> so basically, what's the fiction? Uh, like what the lens is it supposed Yeah, and sort of a different set of lens. And then basically from that point on uh, was like to research how uh, to, instead of using whole head with electrodes, like uh, 64 electrodes, when you're using a medical system like the 1020 system, you have just this whole thing of like electrodes on your head. And if you're a child, that's a, a lot of electrodes. If you're a, you, like a yeah, mature person, it's already a lot. Uh, but um, you basically have all these electrodes on your head in a, a white space with a doctor in a sort of an, an, yeah medical uh, like hospital setting. And that is something that I didn't want to work uh, towards because um, I don't think from the, it's nice for a child, but also from the research perspective, it's not uh, pure data that you're getting. You're not getting your uh, the child in their natural behavior, in their playful behavior. It's more, an, it might be a more condensed behavior because they're a little bit scared because they're in a hospital and all of that stuff. So one of the reasons to make it um, make the horn and then make the design how it is sort of was to uh yeah pull up some of that like sort of playful behavior if they yeah see the unicorn horn sort of you know they already go into sort of this magical uh moment so also like using different kinds of paints on the horns in different colors and all of that stuff but also the other uh, problem was like that you don't want to have all those electrodes on the head so uh, i got in contact with the company uh, gtech through our electronica and claudia schnook and um uh, Christoph Kuker mentioned to me that there's this one one wave called the P300, the P wave of the ERP, uh, which almost looked like a mohawk. So basically, this is uh, what we were enclosing. And the research was about um, if we could measure focus from eight electrodes on these points of the P3 uh, yeah, system almost, and that um, did work out. So that was kind of cool because that means that I could um, embed it in this design, which you can see here. So you can see it on the exact locations of the, of the, the points for the P3. Um, so this became Ancient Unicorn, and then uh, DTEC uh, took it a step further to actually bring it out as an um, as an sort of an eight electrodes. Uh, system which is medical grade uh, called the unicorn hybrid black uh, also unicorn stripe bi.com um, so actually from an uh, yeah project that started of uh, me uh, wanting to work with a medical system which was uh, like over ten thousand bucks um, in the end we could create ourselves like an and uh, yeah, medical system using eight electrodes for makers and for uh, brain computer interface enthusiasts. So you can find it on the website if you want to work with it yourself. And there's also a hackathon um, happening next week and also next month on the website brain.io, you can find more about that. Uh, but this is the hackathon uh, that, uh, that um, GTEC does and then based on um, as inspiration, uh, Aging Unicorn. So that's happening all over the globe. So uh, yeah, if you're interested in that, it's a free workshop that you can uh, learn how to work with uh, brain signals and EEG and also BCIs uh, based on the unicorn interface. So uh, last year we got um, together again to do a project for Ars Electronica and that is one of the latest projects that I was working on. Um, and um, Johannes Kepler University in Linz and GTEC, they uh, created a system of uh, BCI that had 1024 electrodes. So it was over 64 electrodes and each electrode had 16 channels. Um, and um, 
together we created an uh, like a dress with that. So basically, what the dress was doing, it was taking um, each of those uh, yeah sort of electrodes of the brain signals, and it was connecting it to a dress. The dress uh, would then move and light up in different patterns, and we could recognize when somebody was in a more hectic state because the scales were like really uh, shivering, sort of you know they were blinking white. And we could see when somebody was in a neutral state, it was um, like blue color. It was more pulsing, and when uh, the model went into or the wearer went into a meditative state, the whole dress turned like purple and like a sort of wavy flowy movement. So that was kind of an, um, an interesting uh, project, which you, uh, you can find online. But <laughs> When it went into the media, <laughs> somehow uh, they said like mind reading dress, which I got a little bit offended by at first because it was uh, like sort of a different story than we had to this dress. But uh, in a way, that's all fine, sort of. Um, and we had the possibility to uh, present it at Ars Electronica, but also like demo it for three full days, which was kind of cool because uh, yeah, Mac, our model, really got uh, yeah to work with the dress and, and sort of being able to control it in the end. So. <laughs> So yeah, that was one of the like latest projects um, in sort of, yeah, working with uh, EEG. So the last thing to close down with is that um, I think like open source is really important. Um, I try to uh, like, yeah, where I can, I try to put things online. I just want to point this out. It's from uh, the class of Michael Brandt from uh, Vienna. They saw the spider dress and they created actually, I didn't put the spider dress online, but I did other things. So they knew that I did some open source work and they recreated the spider dress and they did that out of uh, Lego. So one thing is like creating a dress from uh, like using 3D printing, but they used the medium of, of uh, Lego to actually recreate this dress and it was a really working dress. Uh, so I, I thought it was really cool. When I uh, gave them a shout out, I said like, wow, that's super awesome that you guys did that. They also recreated the um, the um, cocktail dress, which is a derivative from uh, the Dare Droids, uh, which was uh, showcased for uh, Cirque du Soleil, and this was in uh, Toronto. And they took that idea as well, and they they uh, made it actually, um, yeah, back into uh, like sort of a cocktail dress. And then they went back to Robo Exotica, that me and Jane and Marius presented the Dare Droid for the first time and presented that back. So basically, it was full circle. So. Uh, yeah, I thought that was just really cool. That's kind of the cool thing about like, yeah, putting things on that, online and, and working with open source and the do-it-yourself community. So yeah, um, always I think like if you work with open source, try to have whatever you have online. Maybe you have um, a ring that you modeled, you don't do anything with it. Put it on Thingy first for somebody else to enjoy. Uh, put your code on GitHub, um, put your projects on Hexer.io or Instructable. And also, uh, yeah, the OpenBCI community is, I think, really interesting if you're interested in um, yeah, brain computer interfaces and uh, neuroscience and, and brain signals and all of that stuff. So, yeah, on my Instructable, so I definitely need to do more, but some of the projects that I presented you can find there and um, Hexer.io. 
you can, for example, recreate my um, yeah, light up kitty ears and uh, be all cutesy. It's basically a do it yourself step by step on um, how to make them, how to code them, and, uh, and all of that stuff. So yeah, uh, if you want more information or you're interested in something or you want to try something out or you're looking for a certain kind of um, yeah, electronics, feel free to like send me an email and uh, I might be able to, uh, to help you. And that was, uh, that was it. So I'm gonna give this, the uh, screen back to Jane. Yeah, no, it's good. Thank you. Um, you've got many people clapping. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> okay. that's, that's function, I think. Oh, that's awesome. That's like new to me. That's funny. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Anouk. Um, you've been so busy. <laughs> You're such a hard worker. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, you too. So <laughs> we have that in common. <laughs> Indeed we do. Uh, there's a few things that we've, we have in common that I think we discovered a while ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, actually, that was one of the first questions. There's a lot of questions here and I am going to get to them so everyone knows that I will be getting through to every one of these. Uh, but one of my first questions is uh, uh, just based on, on the topic of us sharing a certain love of materials and we both love technologies and I, I see very similar things that we do. But one of the things mm -hmm. that um, you and I identified on uh, really Really early on was the love of biomimicry yeah. and um, and sort of looking to the natural world to inspire you know your designs and my artwork and I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about how that in that but you, how you use biomimicry how it jumps up what you're looking for and how do that does that inform both the design and the behavior of what of the artworks that you're doing yeah sure um, actually I was listening to your talk this morning at one o'clock and you um, you had one of your works was based on the cephalopod so yeah we, I know <laughs> we both have an octopus or a cephalopod or an inkfish uh, project in there as well um, yeah, I think like animals just have a lot of like interesting uh, things. I look especially at behavior, but also in design, I look at a lot at the, sort of the mechanics of things. Uh, for my own interest, I work with like robotics and I think with robots, we are used to modeling things after humans and I don't think that that's super interesting. So I tend to look at animals, how they behave, how they interact with each other. And I try to put that into my design. So the spider dress has um, yeah, legs from the spider, but it has the behavior of a cat. So when you come close to a cat, it might give you a claw, right? So I'm combining all these hybrid sort of behaviors of nature. So I look a lot in sort of may maybe like by memory uh, yes, I look at process, but also definitely at the behavior of uh, certain animals and certain groups, sort of, because I think it's just, um, yeah, just, just really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, I, I think it opens really a lot of perspectives. And I mean, most of our technologies and the technologies that I work with are, are inspired by animals. I use proximity sensors and ultrasonic range finders, which are based on sonar that is used by bats. Bats, they, um, they use a high frequency that spit, they spit out and they cut it back. And that is how our, our proximity sensors are, are being created, basically, or from Velcro. And I think um, a lot of people don't understand that, like, actually, basically everything that we have is inspired by nature sort of you know so I think that field is definitely really important also to to give that um yeah respect uh, to 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 our nature around us sort of and so would you say then if you you're looking at the behaviors of certain animals does that also inform how the the physicality of the of the dress looks like for example you were talking about the the squid ink and and or the octopus ink and that actually informs also the shape not only the behaviors but the shape of the dresses yeah sometimes the shape the colors that you're using the vibe that it has uh, like um, yeah the, the spiders have like it has these uh, the, the eyes of the spiders are in uh, in the 3d printed spider dress so there's definitely like a lot of uh, things that uh, that you can take from uh, like yeah from nature that you can inspire to uh, sometimes I like to what I say to to uh, base something on an animal like fully sometimes uh, you want to mix multiple animals together as a sort of Frankenstein kind of hybrid kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. but definitely yeah I think it's um, yeah it's interesting uh, to look at uh, at yeah these different ways that you can um, yeah that you can uh, yeah combine it um, you also need to, of course, look from the technology point of view because you cannot do everything that you want to do because it's technology, you know, it, you need to work with uh, possibilities and limitations, I always say, when you work with technology. Uh, so a lot of um, 
the form of, of the designs is actually based on what the technology, uh, the, the space that the technology has. So uh, the space that I needed in the smoke dress for the hips or the space that I need on the shoulders, that's actually more inspired and conformed by the electronics, by the basic electronics that I need to use to, sort of, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so both from, yeah, mechanic side, but also from the sort of the animal side, I think it's a mix. Right. Interesting. Okay, I'm going to get to some of the questions here. Um, so somebody, of course, said they love the drink dispensed in a heart-shaped box. They thought that was great. I still like that idea. Yeah, I still like that the first. Uh, yeah, it was not perfect, but it was definitely uh, that box was kind of yeah super cute. Yeah. Well, it was funny because I remember when you were making that decision and you were just like, I just can't figure out how to make this thing happen on the chest. And then you came up with this hard idea and you were just like, ah, I got it. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Yeah, it's somehow all the rest had too much attention already that this really needed to be an eye catcher almost, you know, so it was kind of fun, uh, fun thing. But I mean, I really like the 3D printed one as well because just uh, it looks so smooth and all. But uh, the first one I kind of liked because it was very makey makey sort of, you know, really a box you know and then like yeah conform so that definitely also has my uh yeah <laughs> she was uh, carmen was very robotic and i think lara was very um alien-esque you know it was definitely like a, a different uh like sleeker style sort of but uh, yeah that, that's yeah it's, it's great like design research um so roberta i don't know if roberta's in uh on uh so roberta can feel free to unmute herself and ask her question or i could just um Ask the question for Roberta. Um, she had asked. Um, I'll just give a second. Like she can jump in if she if she mm -hmm. wants to un unmute herself. Um, she asked. Um, I'm here. <laughs> oh, good. Okay, I'll let you, you ask the question then, Roberta. Um, no, I was. Uh, um, if you can hear me, okay, because uh, like my computer is on charge and oh, I'm using my iPad. So. Um, um, so I noticed that a lot of your dresses are white and I, and I was thinking, okay, so is it something aesthetics? Is it the requirement of the technology? Is it, uh, uh, is there some other reasons for that? Um, because like, it can also be some other type of aesthetics that uh, play into it. So I was very intrigued by that. That's yeah. a very simple question, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I mostly work with one color uh, or non-color. I get really annoyed by colors. I'm really sensitive to them. So if I, um, last project I did was for Ubisoft, the game, the game company for Just Dance. And they asked me to use, I think, nine colors. And I got like super like, wow, because I'm, I'm just, uh, I just always use like non-colors, like black, silver, gray, I think, because um, uh, there's already so much going on. It keeps it a little bit more clear. And mostly when I do a product in white, my next product is very eerie, maybe almost gothic, you know, and then I do a very white, bright kind of thing, skeleton style, whatever that can be. So I get really annoyed by uh, by the sort of the materials and the colors that I need to use. So mostly the, the, the next project, I would flip it sort of. Um, Often when you do something in a dark environment, uh, you can use the shadow of the, you make something dark and it really yeah, pops out. It's very mysterious when somebody walks in it. And of course, like of, uh, all of a sudden you can see it. And sometimes you can use like a white design in a dark space, which really pops out sort of, you know, and then in a gallery setting, you have the opposite. If you smoke, you, you, you um, show this the spider dress, which I have behind me in a white setting, you don't see it. But if the spider dress would be black, then you see it. So it's it sometimes depends on like the venue that I present. I did one collection for um, Audi in where I work with black and white, which I kind of liked, uh, but it was a collection of first four pieces and then eight pieces. Uh, but definitely I have, I have a little bit difficulties with, uh, with color uh, because sometimes it becomes too much. Uh, for Cirque du Soleil, um, I worked a lot with, with more color because they asked me, but mostly my personal works, mm -hmm. I would make uh, yeah, a non-color sort of black or white. Uh, but uh, that's interesting, yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Um, so one person, Kimberly, had asked about, um, well, first of all, one of the things that Anouk's superpower is uh, making beautiful objects. And then her other superpower is finding amazing photographers to shoot her beautiful objects. And uh, Kimberly Whitechurch had said, ooh, the photography would like to know who captured the smoke dress. <laughs> Do you have the name of the photographer? Uh, 
the second one I made, uh, the first one was, uh, the, like the first version is Robert Lunak from um, uh, Vienna. And he is cool. Robert is an, uh, originally, he's like more of a product photographer. He makes uh, photos of like bus and headphones and all of that stuff. And it's kind of cool to work with him because he, um, he uh, he's really um, uh, on like certain textures and all of that stuff. So definitely I shot a lot with him. Um, I shot with a photographer that uh, captures a lot of motorcycles in San Francisco called um, Jason Perry, who shot the, uh, the spider dress and a few of the other photos. So it's kind of funny, um, if you shoot with fashion photographers, which I also do a lot, they want to have a story. And when I shoot with like product photographers, it's more about sort of we treat it as a product. So sometimes if we do editorial, it's like there's a whole story and I'm, I'm just really interested in just shooting the thing. And then there needs to be this whole story. And I'm like, okay, it's gonna be a lot of work. You know, we just need to get it on the, on the picture. So it's, it's kind of interesting how the fashion versus the product photography is very, practical you know I'm Dutch it's like okay let's just like yeah make a photo here uh back side side and then you know uh, so it's uh, yeah it's, but it's fun it's definitely really fun to work with uh, photographers like uh, some of the the latest works I shot myself because I have a camera now especially in COVID I cannot do too many collaborations so um uh, over over like yeah the last I think like 18 years I've been yeah also uh, documenting um, yeah my own work and also photogra photographing it sort of um, and mostly it's in the same like studio setting like a uh, box here box here and a flash from the front or something or uh, like in a, in a yeah a little bit of the similar setting or we shoot it in wherever the thing happens like the event happens sort of using using those lights and I think like light is just uh, yeah light is everything with uh, with photography and that's what you also see on most of those photos they're just really nicely light and setting. Also, um, could you maybe talk a little bit about how you were, because you, uh, when you came to Montreal, you were using, what was that website, Model Mayhem? Uh, yeah, Model Mayhem. Oh, There's the like the more alternative like models on there. Um, but also the uh, photographer. Huh? Remember you found the photographer and the makeup artist? You found everybody on Model Mayhem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that was the kind of the thing. Everybody in the in the past, we all used like Life Journal, and then you had Model Mayhem. So every all the models from Life Journal were like on Model Mayhem. So that's like was a little bit our community. So that's kind of fun. Uh, yeah, it used to be a kind of a uh, yeah cool platform for that sort of. Uh, now I mostly like do a shout out on like Facebook or Instagram or something like that. But definitely like there were a lot of like yeah enthusiasts. Um, I think ten years ago, twelve years ago on the, on the website. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of the cool thing. Um, yeah about those communities you know because everybody was always traveling and for photographers it's really cool to know that that's uh, that certain things are happening in their city sort of so uh, yeah yeah, yeah. So we have a question <laughs> here from eva chen where do you see wearable technologies and its impact on fashion going um i think like what i would say um technology came into our lives to to help us sort of but uh, does it nowadays because i get really stressed of this um because mainly it doesn't listen to my body right so i'm really interested in like fashion and and these things and interfaces almost that they can actually listen to our body and and see when we're whenever we're stressed and maybe not notify us um Basically, when the, the, all the smartwatches and the activity trackers came in, I was hoping that that goes a little bit more along the lines. But if you look at body signals, they do need to be measured on certain places on the body. You cannot take anything from your wrist. So that's a little bit that's, uh, the problem with that sort of. So, yeah, as we create more like almost sensoric second skins, you have more opportunities to, uh, to use a little bit more. Uh, yeah, those ideas like uh, beyond only the wrists. Um, and I think, yeah, that's just really interesting. And also like, if you look at um, yeah, fashion industry, it's a very polluting industry. Cotton industry is one of the most uh, polluting in the world, you know, and we are, that's mainly the reason what I mentioned before, we're not really appreciating garments anymore. We buy them for like, maybe like uh, 10, 20, 30 bucks and we throw them away. They don't have value. And I think if you have a piece of clothing that can listen to your body, that can help you monitor you, knows you, maybe better than, than you do yourself uh, like almost like a le my leather jacket if I lose my leather jacket I will be like super super sad or like a certain piece of clothing and we don't have that value anymore I think and if we have those pieces they might be a little bit more expensive but if they listen to our body they, they become uh, much more valuable um, as well I think it's almost like a familiar you know or a little body that you have around you so I think I really love that um, yeah that notion besides just that it's just 
really unexplored almost the field of fashion tech, um, you know, and electronic garments uh, because of, yeah, a few problems uh, that, that we still need to solve. Um, like uh, maintenance, how to uh, treat your garments. If I sell you a spider dress and it breaks in the evening and you want to wear it, what do you do? Do you, do you bring it back? Do you um, make it yourself? Do you repair it yourself? That's why I'm really interested in the do-it-yourself scene. Or do you go to a ro robotic dressmaker in Toronto, right? Um, and also like energizing. I don't think that the batteries that we have to deal with um, from lipos to just uh, the rechargeable batteries and all of that stuff are really suitable for the body and also the, the shape. So uh, we need like fashion needs flat, organic, round batteries, you know, uh, or kinetic or solar powered or something. Uh, so once the electric, like once the battery um, uh, manufacturers can help out there, I think that will also really speed up a lot of like the manufacturable ideas of all these um, yeah, fashion tech projects sort of. And then the last thing is, um, uh, washability because <laughs> the, the last thing that electronics want is uh, the biggest enemy is water so that's the kind of the cool thing because I know I've been on a washing machine conference which sounds really weird which it was uh, but I know that's a lot of the big brands they are actually uh, some of the brands are busy with um, uh, creating uh, washing machines that don't need water so you can actually um, yeah, clean electronic garments uh, without water which is cool but it's it gets it, it's still stuck in their laboratories and that's a little bit the problem with a lot of this, uh, this stuff but because of that I think the technology industry has an interest in this for say 10 years the fashion industry is a little bit more difficult maybe the last four or five years but it's definitely uh, much more popping up as also other manufacturing uh, design challenges I would say would be uh, solved almost you know so uh, yeah that's a long long explanation for a short uh, question I think but that's what we're where we're standing a little bit Okay, thank you. Um, so just, uh, I'm going to go back to that other person's question, but uh, just briefly, somebody else had asked specifically about batteries. So I thought, <laughs> what, kind of batteries, uh, what batteries are you using and how long do they last? And then I'll go back to the other question. Yeah, uh, sometimes like if you work with heavy robotics, they might need like um, like 12 volts or something. I mostly don't like to do things more than five volts. Uh, sometimes I have product that is uh, 7.4 volt, but in my latest projects, the last like four years, um, I would use like rechargeable uh, batteries. Um, because they're just uh, you can find them anywhere I had a lot of projects that were lipo based and besides uh, being dangerous I find like it's a hell to get them over the border <laughs> to uh, ship them with a product uh, so that's just like you're always like yeah arriving somewhere on a presentation and you need to find lipo batteries like hell no I don't want to go through that hor horror anymore so uh, all the products that I do now are like rechargeable batteries so that's the, the ones that you use for your phone for example you know and they can be pretty flat uh, depending on what uh, mostly I do it um, according to the presentation moment if it's a demo you want it to work for like yeah at least like say most of my designs work between four and eight hours um, especially if you're demoing like something that you need data from you want it to work uh, like uh, longer, like nine to 12 hours, like the B, uh, EEG stuff, uh, you might not want to have on battery. Sometimes if we're demoing testing, we uh, just connect it to the, to the computer, to the power supply. But all the wearable things are, um, yeah, are um, rechargeable batteries. Good, thank you. I still have that battery you, you gave to me before you flew away. You're like, take Please my hold this. this. <laughs> oh, you should buy it. You should discard it, I think, if it gets a uh, uh, poofy. You need to. Yeah. No, I gotta recycle it. I, I think so many people in the world have like some of my leftover from from you. batteries, you know. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. <laughs> Marius, um, oh, yeah, you and Marius can also uh, <laughs> take, uh, take one for that. Yeah. So, um, Eva asked a question. She says, I imagine wearable tech uh, that will store and transmit health information and just for fashion fun can use tech to trans transmit moods either randomly without wears choice like a mood ring for example or transmit information um, like squid and octopus that use uh, the chromatophores as communication um, so I'm not certain if that's a question but it's just more this idea of I guess you know transmitting health information both um, on purpose and maybe just sort of randomly um, is that yeah, that's one of the interesting things on privacy and security that i think is interesting because um if we would um that that's a very sensitive information and a lot of people are um are afraid that hey if my insurance knows that i'm um not doing well do i get a higher premium right so there's a lot of that's um conversations i think going on about privacy always when you have like more um mm, 
think of things like you can look into like body area networks in what, what they use for the military actually on wearables that is a big thing in privacy that you want to think of, about my uh, designs might um, store or research things I, I'm, I would never send anything to the cloud necessarily especially if it's like a product uh, of course that's what we're pushed being pushed into sort of but yeah, I think sort of, of like closed loop systems almost that, uh, again, you can think in creative ways around it, how you can keep that uh, yeah, to the system and just only take what the system really needs in order to interact and all of that stuff. I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, the second thing was about emotions. Um, I think people always say like, oh, emotions. Uh, but um, I think one of the things is that we're still not super, um, um, nobody really has solved that we can reliably measure emotions. And that's always an interesting topic we think we can, but uh, that's actually quite hard because uh, emotions are still, uh, yeah, it turns out to be like needing an, a question and answer thing. Like, I I, uh, I feel that you're sad, are you sad? And it needs a little bit of machine learning to, to have an uh, interaction from you, you know, a spoken word or some kind of input uh, uh, to learn from that sort of so either the machine learning and your AI need to really learn with you for multiple weeks sort of um, but and also like yeah it's really hard to understand still with uh, certain things you can I can say somebody is stressed I cannot necessarily say when somebody's um, afraid or horny for example or uh, the, the the data that I can see from the body might be the same so you need to add another sensor a pH sensor or something in order to research that so to really I always say do reliable uh, emotion sensing of emotions you need multiple sensors connected you need to see, okay, what does the brain do? Okay, how is the pH responding to that? How is the heartbeat? Um, how is the respiration re researching? And you need to always check that at all times to really get a better understanding of uh, emotions. So it's really uh, a lot of like body signals that you want to ideally connect uh, and, and check in with um, sort of uh, almost to, uh, to do so. So it's a little bit like a, a complex thing to really read somebody's emotions. Um, if you do it, other thing, is somebody stressed? Yes, I can measure that by one sensor and uh, three seconds for example you know or uh, i need a baseline of something but um so that's always it it really depends i guess what kind of emotion you are uh, are measuring or want to measure uh and there are ways to do it they're not super easy that's my answer <laughs> that's a great answer thank you thank you um, There's a really interesting system. It's from um, uh, it's called Plux.info, and it's a really um, it's a small pot that I still want to work with for like ten years, and finally I'm going to work with it. But it's uh, connecting actually multiple uh, sensors to your body over that one pot, and you can connect up to eight sensors to it. Um, I'm going to uh, use it uh, next year for a product, and that's um, I think that's kind of the way to again to do it if you want to really reliably uh, measure like um, yeah emotions and all of that. Um, it's called Flux Info, I think. I've got. I just googled it. Yeah, Flux yeah, Info. Yeah, I said it in the chat. It's uh, by people in Portugal. Uh, they're really nice. They're really approachable. Great. And I also have like a do-it-yourself set called Bit. Yeah, bit, you can find it on the website, but they have a lot of like interesting sensors also. That's uh, that big pot is maybe, I think it's like 20,000 bucks, but they also have more available sensors uh, there. So Bitalino maybe, Bitalino. Bitalino, yeah. That's their maker uh, maker thing sort of. Yeah, neat. That's great. 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 That's Bitalino. Uh, so somebody just uh, has also, uh, oh, sorry. Somebody uh, says Rachel Kula is using it uh, in her um, MRP, or for MRP, the Betalino. That's cool. Yay. <laughs> His name is uh, Hugo Silva. That's, uh, that's the founder of that company. Really nice. Um, so somebody else also asked the question about what's the budget for one of these types of dresses? Um, I mean, it depends, yeah? <laughs> yeah. it depends, like um, the proximity dress I make from things that I just had laying around and I use my 3D printer that I have here and my laser cutter or um, so it, it always depends. But yeah, mostly there, mostly it's, it's just really hard to do things below, I think, 2000 to 5000 bucks. Um, if you look at the, the, yeah, the largest project that I did would have been like, yeah, around 80, 80,000, I would say, 
for one dress, but that's a lot of research. That's like the spider dress, for example, you know, uh, but it depends on how much like research and design you need to do. 3D printing is really expensive. If you see the smoke dress, um, the 3D printed one at that time was like 10 years ago, was 6,000 uh, euro to 3D print, but I got it sponsored because I was working with the, uh, the 3D printing company sort of, you know, so definitely like a lot of like um, early like 3D printing techniques, uh, they were like super expensive. If I would print it now again, it would have been maybe one for of that price sort of but definitely like uh, yeah 3d printing is, is still expensive um using 60 motors in a design can also be fairly expensive you know or like trying to figure out how to uh, code or sometimes i work with uh, like need to work with developers all of that stuff and and sometimes you work alone sometimes you work with a team so i think it always uh, it always depends and uh, i'm happy enough to have a lot of like companies like sponsor me like um uh, from like motors to uh, computer boards to maybe 3d printing and all of that stuff so I'm fortunate enough to uh, yeah to have cool partners that let me do research and design. Otherwise, I could not survive this. <laughs> so yeah, it's an expensive hobby, but uh, yeah. Do you think that this would become a more accessible trend in the future for the world of performing arts? Do you see it getting cheaper or? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, I think there are so many like more do-it-yourself things than like when I started in, in 2000 and you also when you started like we had to deal with big computers and not nothing that we wanted to do was there sort of you know so you need to make your own board so you need to make your own technologies almost um, so I think there's like so much things available from uh, Plux dot, uh, like info what we just talked about their system of 10,000 or 20,000 and then uh, like spoofing off like a, a Bitalino which um, is like affordable sensors for makers to use you know uh, which are maybe not medical grade but are really um, yeah good to use almost you know so I think there's a lot of people that that are really like helping out there and I mean technology and, and electronic comp uh, components and, and all of that stuff is, is fairly expensive uh, is fairly inexpensive right now I find uh, so that opens up a lot of like opportunities um, you have of course a lot of like the digital um, um, uh, I'm curating an exhibition for people in Bali at the moment with a lot of projectors and if I see the prices of those projectors they're like 15,000 or 20,000 each projector you know if you work in a field like immersive kind of projection maps, uh, like uh, things, you know. So I think there's always technologies that are a little bit newer and newer technologies like laser technology in, in that kind sort of, you know, that will always be um, yeah, expensive and maybe get like less expensive over time. Um, but I think definitely with sensors, they're pretty available and, and cheap. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, somebody asked, uh, do you have a favorite artwork so far? Any dress, uh -huh. any favorite dress? <laughs> Can you choose from your children? <laughs> I asked that question to you uh, this morning. Did I, yeah, I want to ask that as well. Um, uh, I think like, yeah, that's, I guess really, I think it's really hard. I, I do know that if I'm done with a project, sometimes I don't want to think about that for, for a while, if it was a really difficult one, sort of. Uh, but definitely like, yeah, all the dresses that are named and many more projects. I think um, if you do something that uh, you're fully behind, um, then I think it's really cool. I had in the past some things that I did either for myself or only for my clients. If I do them only for myself, I'm not super happy. If I do them only for my clients, I'm not super happy. But if there's a nice blend in between, like the collection I did for Audi, I think you really see my style and really see their identity as well. So I'm really proud of that collaboration. There might be yeah, other collaborations that it was just not necessarily there in terms of time or design or something like that. You might be like less proud of it, but I think there's always a design challenge uh, in every project that you do, because otherwise it would be boring. So for that, I would never do something twice. For uh, So for that, there's always an, an interesting design challenge in whatever you built, I think. So, um, very yeah. diplomatic answer. You know, it's very diplomatic. Answer, yeah, but, uh, yeah, I should just have said uh, like one, one or the other. It's always the one that you haven't made yet, but <laughs> it's me. It's all the all the babies. <laughs> yeah, but well, you don't want your, your dresses to feel unloved. No. Um, <laughs> Get stuck in the back then afterwards. <laughs> yeah. Um. So one person. Uh, Oh, somebody wants to know about your rings. Is there liquid in them? Oh, there's, um, yeah, they're from uh, uh, Pilonus. There's, um, I don't know if you can see it. There's like uh, ink in there. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of cool if you wear them because your hands are being pulled out of position like slowly, you know, it, it feels, you feel the graffiti uh, at work sort of, but there's, uh, there's ink in there. <laughs> 
Yes. <laughs> okay, so somebody, uh, Victor Tan said, thank you, Anup, you are amazing. I am from a computer science background, and it's amazing mm -hmm. to see arts major person to be so technological and biologically savvy. I really like the wearables on mental state research. I wonder if one day a wearable can help us understand people who have trouble expressing themselves, such as autism, uh, children with ASD, or a person who suffered a stroke. Yeah, um, actually the Aging Unicorn project uh, started uh, by me using RealSense camera. That's why the horn is so long uh, on children with autism uh, to make a system that um, they have on that says, okay, this person is um, uh, might be sad. Is this true? Or like to make a question and answer system with them. Uh, the problem was with the uh, children on the spectrum, uh, especially with autism, they don't really want to have necessarily anything of, on their head, sort of, you know. There was also like some uh, people on the spectrum that had like ADHD that were were uh, awkward out by it but uh, not enough like they were super interested in like okay but what is that thing sort of and that's actually how I, I started to later on uh, go into like uh, working with kids with ADHD instead of uh, children on the autism spectrum and um I was like uh, creating some other IDs, more softer blankets kind of IDs for the group with autism. Um, <clears throat> and then Aging Unicorn actually went into the research with ADHD, uh, in which then became like uh, based on brain signals. Um, I think autism is, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting uh, in regards to, uh, yeah, uh, what they mention uh, emotions. And um, often it's the notion that, uh, yeah, people with autism don't, don't know emotions, but they do know emotions. The problem is like what to do then sort of often you know so that's definitely an interesting thing that's a wearable can uh, possibly like work out uh, or help out with like i did with the unicorn horn it only went from like yeah they didn't want to have anything basically on their head or near the head area sort of <clears throat> that's why i think um a lot of research with that and objects is mostly like toys and cuddle toys anything soft uh works well works really well with them uh with uh, yeah doing anything sort of but uh yeah definitely Oh, um, epilepsy is interesting to uh, to see the rapid eye movement. So if you have anything with an, uh, a thing here that you can uh, yeah measure the eye movement and then sort of signal, you can basically signal before that the child gets um, a stroke. But you can now also do that with um, certain watches and uh, they, they measure not through rapid eye movement, but I don't know exactly what they use for that, but so they can um, like uh, yeah measure it before it starts so the parents can or the uh, caretaker can can help the the, the, the child get in an, uh, an, a good situation a safe environment sort of interesting interesting um so uh we're gonna i guess slowly uh, go down um, slow it down a bit but there are a couple of last questions and they are kind of connected. we'll make them short <laughs> sorry oh, oh no not at all i mean we can talk forever but i just um <laughs> So one person kind of basically had said that they're just curious about the links that you that you mentioned. So I think that'd be super great if you can give me whatever links so I can send it to everyone. But yeah. somebody else um, asked, I'm a fashion designer and interested to work with interactive and technology in my designs. Can you tell me how I should start or how I can start? Yeah, um, I think like the easiest way to get into like uh, your head around like coding and all is get an Arduino um, and then download Arduino from arduino.cc. It's an, um, yeah, sort of simplified version of C++. Um, there's a lot of like examples online uh, by a few like NeoPixels on Adafruit, make them blink, uh, buy a little motor, make it move. Um, or if you have like really something that you want to do uh, with it, maybe like send me an email. I will put my email address here again. It's Anugreplex at gmail.com um, to, yeah, how to approach it. Because uh, the main thing is like, yeah, just having a little bit of knowledge on uh, either the coding aspect or you collaborate with somebody. Um, and then, yeah, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to make uh, something inflate, move, uh, smell, uh, yeah, make music, make sounds, listen to something. There's a lot of uh, ways that you can do that. There's an, actually an, an interesting book by uh, friends of us. Um, let me just get it. Oh. It's, uh, it's these books from, uh, from Make are kind of really fun. <clears throat> this one is um, Making Things Talk. And that's actually a, a really fun, uh, uh, fun book um, that uh, Tom Igu uh, wrote a while ago. So it has like a lot of examples uh, that can be yeah, interesting, but you can also find a lot of that on uh, like instructables.com, for example, you know. But if there's something specific that you want to do, the fashion to do sort of, you can always send me an email as well. And I can uh, give you some uh, links. And I will send all the links to Jane as well so she can uh, supply them. <laughs> That's very generous of you. That's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I think we've reached the end of the uh, questions. But one of the things that I was 
I've been curious about um, mm -hmm. because I see the stuff that you're doing floating around the big, big internet. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things, could you talk just briefly about the collaboration you have with the uh, musician, uh, something Moder Moderna, the, the woman oh, in, yeah. in, uh, in the UK? Uh, I thought the work with the prosthetic is really amazing. So I just would love to hear you talk about there's, it. Yeah, there's so many products. Uh, yeah, so I collaborate since 2016 with Victoria Modesta, who is a uh, bionic pop artist. You can find her, Victoria Modesta. And if you type both of her names, you can also see the, the legs that I created for her. So the first one was a leg. She steps in it and it starts to smoke. Um, I created a leg for her that she moves and she can make sound with it. It's called Sonifica. Uh, Sonifica. The other leg is called Smokific. Location <laughs> free, and um, also a leg with a Tesla curl, and it has an um, Jacob's ladder effect going in. There's a, a small Tesla curl in the heel, and a circuit board yep. in the United Nudes, and then she has a void space in her leg, and there's like electricity going in it. It was for Rolls Royce. Uh, I made a light up spike for her bionic sh uh, showgirl show in Paris, and um, a spike with a mechanic uh, component in it. So. And now we're making three more legs. <laughs> so I made, uh, I think I made with her like six or seven legs now. Uh, but she's a really interesting person in uh, in the field of uh, people that are differently abled, um, especially with the uh, prosthetics and amputee. I think she's giving a lot of like agency about like controlling your own body and your own, um, yeah, your own uh, sort of, uh, yeah, how do you say that? Um, just the nature of uh, who you are and what happened to you and uh, uh, you do something in her case very artistic with it so she's really fun to um, yeah to prototype with and we always come up with these uh, like really interesting legs and uh, for me I always have a leg laying behind me that I that I need to work on now with her mm -hmm. uh, so it's definitely uh, yeah she's definitely cool you should uh, check her out yeah no I think it's a really interesting project um, and the last question I have <laughs> I got to know about the Tesla coil, the electric, the, the electrifying suit. I've shown it to my classes. So uh, for those who are here, Anouk mm -hmm. wore an outfit that no model wanted to wear. And so she had to wear it herself. And then she, well, I, did you, what, tell, maybe tell everyone about it because it's a fabulous little. Yeah, I was working at the Autodesk at Pier 9 and we had this really big water jet. I don't know if you know what a water jet is, but uh, we had access to the water. So there's this big, big machine that you can uh, work with, uh, like just uh, cut out metal and all. So I made a full metal suit, a Faraday. You can find it on Instructables, um, how to make your own Faraday cage dress, it's called. I don't do it. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, then uh, to test it out, we had these uh, really big Tesla coils for my friend friends called architect Joe and John de Prima and so basically um, we needed a model to test it out so I was putting on Facebook like hey anybody wants to wear my new dress in in, uh, in between Tesla curls and so nobody reacted so I, I just put it on myself and then the day after I got like millions of emails like hey do you still need that model and I was like no I, I did it myself so too late <laughs> It was noisy. Oh my God. You know, and I felt my spine like shake for like a week after or something like that. But it was definitely like a really fun, fun experience. I don't know if I was a really good model. I don't think so. But just for the, the heck of it. I mean, it was the Maker Fair in 2014. Uh, so but uh, the Instructables is kind of funny. Um, yeah, how to get Oh, no, it's called how to get fashionably strike stricken by lightning i think yeah yeah like yeah definitely uh <laughs> definitely fun yeah you can see there the whole do it yourself and the testing and all of that stuff so yeah dangerous <laughs> we were it was really well grounded sort of you know and we tested it like you cannot really um, instruct uh, you cannot really fully test it sort of but we did it in parts but definitely the first time we fully tested it was on the um oh yeah on stage and joe was behind me and then we were just like he just yeah he just flashed it like once and we were looking at each other i was like okay yeah it's fine i guess you know but <laughs> It was definitely a fun experience. And then after it, we did, we did it, I think, like six times a day or something crazy like that. So <laughs> definitely a small thing. <laughs> Yeah. Well, um, I think I speak for everyone and um, we've got a captive audience still. Everyone's still here. So I know I do speak for everyone. Thank you so much and for your time. Yeah, and thank you your, so much for inviting and I hope to see you soon again. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and um, yeah, we'll uh, see you on March 19th uh, for the uh, Lindsay Grace um, talk. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.